without further ado, I am going to introduce David Brancaccio, who is our keynote speaker today. And he is going to talk to us about his amazing investigative report. He's with uh, Marketplace, with American Public Media. And you guys, I, I'm not going to give great introductions with bios, because I could go on and on about every single speaker that we have. But it's in your packet. So if you want to learn more about David Prancaccio and the amazing work that he's done, please review that his bi biography. And David, if you could come on up, let's hear about brains and losses. Thank you. I'm going to take that mic, I guess. There we go. Excuse us just a second. Address him. All right, and then and this. Yep. Yeah, we'll just speak into that. And on video, you hear an audio out there? You look at him, thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs up. And we'll do a little bit of uh, getting into this sucker. Give me a sec. Uh huh. Is it there? Awesome. All right. Wow. Cool noises. Thank you for inviting me. I had not seen downtown Gainesville before. It's cool. It's really cool. I've been here on business before doing some TV shoots for PBS, but uh, it was a lot of fun last night. Um, also, thank you for inviting me. I didn't have to get up at 4 a.m. That's what the lot of the radio morning man is. We get up very early to do our thing. And we do broadcasts every hour throughout the morning until the West Coast is satisfied. So, you know, I, um, you know, I have to do little vocal exercises in the morning to get ready to go on the radio. And um, it is, uh, one of them that I sometimes do is one that you must remember. Uh, you must remember a canner, a canner exceedingly canny, one morning <laughs> remarks to his granny, a canner can can anything that he can, but a canner can't can a can, can he? <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> a canner exceedingly canny, one morning remarks to his granny, can 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 anything he can, but a canner can 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 he? Right? So you get all warmed up, but it's the word canny. We know what that means, right? Canny. It's like especially astute, right? That's what canny means in that context. A better word I like is shrewd. And what you're getting here is we'll have scientists, we'll have people involved in social services, we'll have people from the policy side of this and the law. I'm the storyteller who has a humanities background. And so I look at this from the storytelling point of view, but also how words can also help what we're trying to do. Shrewd. Think about your coworkers right now. All right? Just think about like the group shot of your uh, coworkers. I'm very lucky at Marketplace. They're great. There's not a knucklehead among them. They're really, they're really not. There's a great group of people both in Los Angeles and uh, DC and in New York where I am. And they're all smart. They're all with it. They're all organized. All of them have high executive function. However, would I say that every one of them is shrewd? Shrewd is a superpower. Shrewd is able to judge people in situations well and make good decisions. I get, I have some coworkers who are shrewd. I interview super shrewd people. Ray Dalio was in not too long ago. He is the founder of the biggest hedge fund on the planet Earth. And he's from Queens, New York. He's a regular guy, doesn't come in with a tie. He's got the knack for assessing situations and critical thinking, shrewd. And why I think shrewd is interesting is, if you're not shrewd, you know, some of your coworkers are fine. They do what they got to do, but you wouldn't call them shrewd. That's not a deficit. That's not a cognitive impairment. That's just some people have the extra power, but with the assaults that we're seeing on people, both from scammers and from relatives, we're asking people of all ages to be shrewd all the time. And as we'll hear, I'll mention some of it from my reporting, 
uh, but we'll have the actual scientists here talking about the idea, is maybe some people in certain situations because of the environment, sociological reasons or changes in the brain associated with normal aging and sometimes aging that may be leading to abnormal behavior, we lose the shrewd part. And we're, the shrewd is asking a lot. Everybody can't be Warren Buffett. Everybody can't be this guy Ray Dalio able to fend off industrial strength assaults on people trying to take their money. Let's see if I can get this done. I'm doing two PowerPoints at once. Um, when we're doing this, this is an hour-long documentary. It's actually 51 minutes. If you just Google Brains and Losses Marketplace, you'll see the narrative version of it, the written out version. But also, if I could commend it to you, if you put on some headphones or turn up your speaker, you could hear the whole thing. That's probably the more powerful version of it. We also did seven or eight stories on the air that were about four or five minutes long. Uh, those are good, too. They're similar. But where we really draw the threads of this together, Brains and Losses, the bottom line on aging and financial vulnerability is the title we finally came up with because we're a business show across the country. Um, we're trying to figure out what to call it, though. That, was, that took a lot of arguing among all these uh, shrewd and not so shrewd colleagues of mine. Um, the original working title was First Thing to Go. The ability, you know, when you, make, when, when you start uh, making imprudent decisions about money, but the problem with that title is it's just wrong because being exploited isn't necessarily mean you're on a rocket sled toward a cognitive impairment. It, it may mean that it's an early sign, and scientists are interested in that, but it may not mean. So first thing to go isn't right. We thought of grifters and grandparents. That was okay for a while. <laughs> Caught off guard, how strangers, friends, and family can rob elders blind. It's a little clumsy. Uh, the trust disorder, because it's this notion of you're trusting inappropriately. But now that I've settled on this word that helps me understand what we're asking of people, how about just the taming of the shrewd? <laughs> All right, no, we didn't do that. Now, just uh, speaking of disclaimers, I am not a medical man. I am not a scientific researcher. I am not law enforcement. I'm not an attorney. I'm none of those things. I'm just. I'm going to share some things that I found in my journey, and luckily the structure of this particular gathering is such that the people who know what they're talking about are coming next. <laughs> um, but what I am is, I think, a storyteller, a reporter, and I, you know, it's my job to channel to our audience, and there are a lot of, it's a big audience, 11 million people. Um, I'm supposed to channel real stories designed to teach about our world. I mean, it's my hope that it makes the world a better place, the stuff that we do. It's hard to measure if we are, but that's the intention. Shannon invited me to share a little bit about the journey. It was, yeah, it was 18, it was actually almost two years that I worked on this story, uh, Brains and Losses. What I'll be doing during this presentation is, just so you understand the structure, uh, as we go along, I'm going to play two short extracts from the audio documentary. Each of them, is one is like a minute and a half, the other one was like two minutes, 15 seconds. Then there's a short video, it's only two minutes, and then there's one more coda, another stretch of audio that's also two minutes. These are not long, and I hope they're compelling enough to uh, keep your attention. I want to tell you about a woman who really affected me that I met during the reporting of Brains and Losses. Uh, she is a registered nurse, knows her way around an operating room. When I first met her, she was 78. I think she's just turned 80. Yes, her birthday is, yes, just turned 80. At 78, 79, 80, she's still a substitute school nurse in schools. They call her in. She doesn't have to do all the bureaucracy of the actual school nurse, but she can do subbing. Does it four days a week. It's not an easy job. Um, she drove me around in her SUV. Uh, she's a better driver than I am. She does math in her head better than I do. And she moved east from the west some years ago to care for her dying daughter. She lives alone. Her husband had died in an airplane crash a dozen years earlier. 
and she's amazing. She, so I will call her Nurse Judy. That's her real first name, Judy. And um, she was the victim of quite a set of circumstances. Let's see if I can just give you a hint and you'll, we'll start, we'll hear Judy's voice in just a second. And now we're setting out to revisit the scene of the crime, the gift card rack at Walmart. It was Thanksgiving weekend and I was just hanging around the house answering the phone like a fool. I didn't know and he said, I'm from Microsoft, you're having a problem with your computer, I have to get into it to help you fix it. We don't know who this guy was, but let's just stipulate it was not Microsoft. The year in question, Microsoft compiled 153,000 complaints about tech support scams around the world. One in seven people lost money. Judy clicked to give the guy remote access. I know, Judy, don't do it. But she did, and watched as her computer was taken over. I let him in, and I, I remember saying to one of them, I love it when you take my cursor and just move it around. I look back, and I can't imagine what I was thinking. I was like a robot. The scammer who takes control of Judy's computer directs her attention to what looks on her screen like a readout from one of her accounts at U.S. Bank. He wanted to show me it was at zero, 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 and you can make it up if you do what I say. All right, we're getting some of this. So she gets the call that many of us have gotten from tech support. The average loss in the tech support scam is $650. It's not a lot, but it's a lot for some. Um, anybody could fall for this. My own father, 85, Pat Brancaccio, they tried. But my dad is shrewd and he figured it out. He told him to get, you know, he's from Brooklyn. He's a retired professor, but he's from Brooklyn, New York originally, and he told the guy to buzz off. But um, she let him in, and when I went through her credit cards subsequently, all those months and months of credit cards, I found a listing for $379.99 from an unusual company in the Northeast. When I looked them up, they hardly had any trace, but they supposedly did computer tech support. And just by the way, word for the wise, I thought it was so unusual when she told me this story, I'm going to hear more about it in a second, but this is what they can do. You get a call months later, sometimes a year later. There's a woman in South Carolina got a call over a year later. Nice voice on the phone says, you know you signed up for tech support that time? You didn't get real service, did you? Yeah, it turned out they went out of business. We're sorry, we would like to refund your money. Give us your bank account information. My father-in-law's got that call repeatedly. I actually have a recording of his answering machine message with that phone call. He luckily didn't respond. Uh, she responded. So one of her accounts, you just heard, should have been $29,500 and something dollars, but it looked to her like it was zero. If you grab me later during lunch, I can explain how they can do it. I figured out how they can do it. Um, and uh, without triggering banking red flags. So she freaked out between you and me, it wasn't just a regular bank account. It was the bank account she was responsible for for a condo that she helps manage. So was it all her money? So she's thinking, oh my goodness, the money I'm responsible for that isn't fully mine is, looks like it's zero. And you heard what she said. I will give, they promised to give her all the money back if, they, if she did what they said. Get back to that. Doctors are studying people of all abilities, but they're also especially studying people who seem fine who are older. A-OK, -okay, on the ball, I would say, like Nurse Judy. Um, by the way, after my interactions with Judy, I met her many times, several interviews, I was talking to a, uh, a gerontologist at one of the big New York hospitals. And I was like, she's fine. And he says to me, and I deserve this. He said, yeah, because you have an MD in this field, you're in a, you have the capacity to evaluate. Fair enough, right? And the problem is, it may not be a doctor who's, in other words, it may just be a family member who's like, is this person doing okay? She seems like she's doing okay. So doctors are studying people who are on the ball, A-okay. People then who then go on to be tested as being cognitively fine, 
healthy older person, yet the interesting area of research is they may still be at special risk from those who want to take their money, be it scammers from down the street, from uh, who you may meet in person, uh, or faraway places, or in fact family. There is brain research suggesting, and, one, and a, a team of researchers is here today to talk more about it, that your scam that's on the lookout for uh, threats may get dimmer or go dark in some people. And uh, people 50 and older hold 83% of the wealth in America. It's quite a statistic. Households headed by people in their 70s and 80s have the highest median, that is to say typical, income net worth. Net worth. That's where the money is. And Shannon mentioned that big study, just so if you want to ever look it up, keywords are true link financial. That's the one that uh, casts its net pretty wide and thinks it's a loss of $36 billion a year. Uh, it's a pretty good study, but we need more work in this area. We spent a lot of time trying to get even more definitive numbers. And what you'll see is a lot of articles quoting a quite out of date from 2011 MetLife study that said, oh, it's only $3 billion a year. Only $3 billion? That's a lot of money anyway. But no one takes the, few people take the, two, the $3 billion a year seriously. It's much higher. We also do know from real research that this exploitation is radically underreported. So how did they, she didn't just lose 29 grand. Remember I said it created the illusion that she lost 29,000? She did lose money. The scammer's weapon of choice? Listen to Judy tell her story. And now we're setting out to revisit oh, the scene of the crime. Oh, stop it. Gift. And now we're setting out to No, this is... You may already kind of know what that is. And she'll say it here. Gift cards, a whole line of gift cards. On Judy's small circular kitchen table, we laid out all the used cards, piles and piles of them, covering every available space on the table. We look at one of the credit card statements listing the gift card purchases. Target, $2,000. Oh, Judy, and then on the 1st of December, it keeps going. Oh, do I miss one? Walmart Supercenter in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. I missed that one on 11.30. For how much? For $6,000. All right, 33, 37, 41, 43, 45. $45,000 of gift cards. Judy, Judy, Judy. Several clerks at Walmart had even warned Judy she might be getting scammed. Gift cards are a favorite method of scammers to move money without much trace, and recently many big stores have been changing the rules around gift cards. But again, Judy held out hope that if she did what the guy on the phone said, she'd get all her money back. All in all, there were over 100 used Target and Walmart cards, and she kept the receipts. Total, $166,000. And that's not all. Scammers also talked her into a bank transfer. $45,000 to a company in Nepal. Judy lost, by my calculation, about $196,000. For a school nurse who's working a couple days a week, that's a lot of money. Well, you could say that, yeah. It could have been worse, but one of her credit card companies reversed nearly 25 grand, agreeing it was fraud. Eventually, Judy says her tormentor showed her on her computer a $200,000 check written out in her name with the promise it would make her whole if she gave him more money still. And it was completely fraudulent. I think that was the comma was in the wrong place and the zeros were, I was not ready. At this point, she was done and cut off communication. Her accounts ravaged. All this was paid for through savings, retirement money, and running up credit cards with the scammer telling her to call and raise her credit card. Get back to Judy in a little while. She's fabulous, though. And I'm so sorry that, that these are the circumstances under which we met. Um, we're still in touch. I just talked to her the other day. Oh, we actually sent emails yesterday uh, to each other. 
But her experience fits a pattern. I was emailing a couple weeks ago with a prominent gerontologist, and this is what he wrote. This is an expert in this field, I would say world-renowned. He wrote me about an older man he has followed as a patient for almost 20 years. This expert said the man was cognitively intact, implication that he had tested the guy, fine, but had just given away the farm under my nose. I did not see it coming, this is the doctor, and had counseled him prophylactically about this at nearly every visit because he had a wife who had passed away and he seemed to be a mark. It still happened. You can see why we have to get ahead of the situation. So uh, we, um, as part of this project, Brains and Losses, we had, um, you know, projects like this depend on real expertise, not just some radio announcer talking about this stuff. And we talked to uh, Dr. Mark Lax, who's a gerontologist at Weill Cornell, the big hospital in New York City who's one of the people who came up with a definition, a working definition called age-associated financial vulnerability, which I alluded to earlier. Um, it's not like a syndrome. Uh, they can't yet put your head in a scanner and go, oh, you got it. <laughs> but they're trying, and we're gonna hear more about that. Talk to uh, Nathan Sprang, who's director of McGill University's Laboratory of Brain and Cognition, who's here with us today along with a colleague, Gary Turner. You will hear from them in a little bit. Um, and one of the amazing things, and I don't want to steal their thunder, and they will get into details, but just to kind of prepare you maybe for what they're going to talk about later. Um, amazing how hard, uh, imagine how hard the following would be to do. They found, I think it was 13 people agree, who agreed to be studied who had been victims of scam. It's super hard to get people to talk to you not just as a reporter, it's a nightmare, but even as medical people, it's super hard. And then they found 13 demographically similar people where they hadn't been scammed, but there had been a scam attempt, if I understand this correctly. And they studied their brains in a brain scanner. And as I think they're gonna mention, or you can ask them if they don't, um, they found differences in the, in the two populations. There's like a part of the brain or parts of the brain that may be diminished in their capacity to warn you of danger ahead. I don't know if it's quite, we wrestled with this analogy, maybe the researchers blanch at this. Um, I think of it as like a spidey sense from Spider-Man, you know, when you're walking down a dark alley where you, or you've parked somewhere at night and you're thinking, it doesn't feel right and you're supposed to act on that. It's that kind of stuff as I imagine it. We talked to Duke Han, who collaborates with the first guy, Mark Lax. He also has his scanners out west. He is trying someday, he's, he's been quoted as saying, looking for biomarkers for this stuff so that the attorneys don't have to just say, come on, there's some kind of something going on with the person, even though we know they don't have a formal diagnosis of some dementia. Um, the lawyers will weigh in on this issue. Um, he's interesting. Duke Han said something very important to me, and I need to emphasize this with you. Uh, not every older person is at diminished capacity. Warren Buffett, or in the case of Duke Han, the researcher at University of Southern California, he says his father, presumably a generation older, um, will always be better at money than himself, the son. It depends. Uh, Peter Lichtenberg, who comes at this not from a neuroscience point of view, but a psychological, he comes up with batteries of questionnaires and interviews to help assess this kind of stuff. He really emphasized the variability among older people. There are people in their 50s who are not good at this stuff. Um, there are people in their 90s who are, again, better than I will ever be. Um, and, you know, young people are scammed all the time. Depends on the scam. The IRS scam, you know, the police are coming unless you pay now with your credit card. Younger people fall prey to that because they have less experience filing their tax returns. It might be the mommy and daddy did it until they were into college. They know, we know that the IRS never calls. So important takeaway point there is that wisdom counts. I got that from Marty DeLima from the Stanford Center on Longevity. Wisdom and life experience counts and can counteract things that are happening in the brain. 
Certainly can, but may not. Um, and it just depends on the scam. Young people all the time. But the thing is that someone said it at the table last night. We have a voice in the piece that says this as well. The thing is, with an older person, you have less time to make up the loss. Right? And then what happens if you can't make up the loss? Either if you have other family, you rely on them. But if you don't, you rely on more social services. And it becomes a taxpayer issue, not to be too blunt. Um, here's something that none of the researchers in this orbit mentioned to me. I just found, and I just, it just lingers with me. We put it into the piece toward the end. You can use this for your grant proposals. <clears throat> it is an award-winning paper published by Brookings. Peak age for handling money is 53. It's 53. I'm past peak age for money. So think of the implications. You're at your most awesome, the population is at its most awesome best at 53. So if you're older, are you at your peak? Maybe not. And then Shannon Miller, who without her, none of this would have happened, uh, she opened my eyes to that distinction that she put on the table of people who are seen as exploitable and people who are seen as not exploitable. Right? That's independent of whether or not someone has a diagnosable dementia or is heading toward dementia. Some people are exploitable. Another quick point, crucial, underscored by all the people I talk to, but especially by the Stanford Center on Longevity. It's not just your brain may be changing. That is probably the case in many cases. It's also other factors that can lead to the fact that your ability to be really shrewd and stand up against the onslaught of these scams can be influenced by just social isolation. If you're living alone, Judy lives alone. She had friends. She claims to have two gentleman friends in this latest email. Um, uh, that she says, I didn't quite know how to read it. She said, that I spend time with. And then the next sentence is, spend time in capital letters. So I guess they pass the time together. I don't know what she was thinking I was thinking. Um, so she's not alone alone, but she's alone, right? There wasn't someone at the house when the phone was ringing saying, wait, a second set of eyes and ears. Uh, something that I didn't know the term because I'm just a guy, polypharmacy. Older people may be taking more, uh, many different medicines, but crucially different doctors prescribing them, not talking amongst themselves. And you could be a little bit yeah, wacky, someone just said, uh, out of it because you're on some medicine uh, at diminished capacity. Let me tell you about, um, so we, we didn't just feature Judy. That is an amazing, compelling story. She was so brave to talk to us. But uh, we met a lot of interesting people with these horrendous stories. Um, Don McClurg lived in Hollywood, Florida. He's a was a decorated gunnery sergeant. He's like Forrest Gump, the guy from, the, my, from how when I went through his, his history. He was both at the Normandy and Okinawa invasions and was in Tokyo Bay during the Japanese surrender. And sounds like an amazing guy. Got to his early 90s, out for a stroll with his cane in Hollywood, Florida, met a charming younger person who wove her way into his life and started taking his money. But the thing is, his um, son is a law professor at the University of Memphis. His daughter was a prosecutor. He's really shrewd <laughs> kids. And you should see the email correspondence over a year of them trying to persuade dad that she was a nightmare and just trying to rip him off. He was so upset with them from raising these issues. It was, he was intransigent on this stuff. Um, it was, he, but they got, in this one case, some things fell together. There was a really motivated detective down in Hollywood, Eddie Goldfarb, just took this on as a personal mission. He recognized who the woman was, and she had a previous record suggesting that she was uh, a kind of a, a scammer on steroids. And um, against the father's wishes, they move this forward. Why didn't he just get conservatorship guardianship? I forget which one it is in Florida. Well, he consulted experts and they said, you might, your father is in his 90s, but he's fine. And the judge isn't gonna think he's incapacitated. Um, 
And also, if you win, you may destroy your relationship with your father if this is against his will. This is a really intense issue that many people in this room have probably greater uh, understanding of than I do. But they did go to court and they won and they got partial restitution. He lost not quite 100,000, she gave back 50,000. I can't remember, is this in the piece? It's in the long version of the piece. On the day that the court, that she's supposed to go get the money and give him back his 50,000, the scammer says to, in court, leaving court, says to Don, okay, I'll give you this money back. Why don't you use it to buy a small house and I'll move in and take care of you? The daughter's head, she said, or da the daughter said, my head exploded. <laughs> Sorry to say, Don McClurg died three months after the court case, which is Shannon's point. The kids can't draw a direct line between what happened, but it has to have been stressful. You know, the scammer will go, well, he was 90 something. Yeah, we know that this can be fatal. Restitution is rare. We also talked to, I have to call him Jason. He was willing to have his, name, his first name on the air. Our lawyers said, no way. You'll know why when I tell you the story. Um, Jason is the most lovely 24-year-old you're ever going to meet. Super on the ball, already has an undergraduate degree, now getting a science degree. And uh, desperate because his mom, who had been divorced some years earlier, had given $100,000 to a man she had never met. Maybe he's not even a man. It's some entity online, an emailer. They even were supposed to get married in Israel, and she had like bought flowers and stuff. And it, of course, he broke it off. Um, when you see the content of the emails, they're don't pass any of your muster in this room. You'd be like, this isn't legit. Somehow, she kept believing it. There's a 19-year-old daughter, this guy Jason's sister, trying to convince mom not to keep throwing money away. Um, he had gone to the sheriff. He went to the banks. He's not a co-signer in the accounts. Nothing you can do. He was just desperate. Um, mom would never talk to me. So we had to be very careful about obscuring where this had happened and who they were exactly. And I called just before air one more time saying, just tell your mother, you know, that she, we'd love to, so we, is she aware that we were about to do this? We're not identifying her, but you know, we'd love to get a, her reaction to this, but she maybe understandably didn't want us to talk to us. I did just get an update, because I, um, I stayed in touch with Jason in fact, I did a public appearance at uh, the radio station that's nearby him to raise money for the radio station. And I invited him and his fiance, who came under their real names. And they said, how do you know this bright young man? I said, oh, he helped with the story at one point. Lovely young couple. But he just emailed and said his mom, after two years, figured out that it was a scam and is cut off. Took two years, took $100,000. But she didn't lose the house. She has a nice house. Now, why am I even talking? Why was that even in this? piece. She was 56 or 7. The definition of age-associated financial vulnerability is making bad money decisions in a way that is inconsistent with previous behavior. And his mom was a successful business person until recent years. And this was not like the way that she used to be. And so you have to start being on the lookout perhaps earlier than we realize. What do we do? What are some of the thoughts about what to do in the face of some of this? Financial services industry can play a role. Talk to a wonderful woman from my home state, Maine. Her name is Judy Shaw. She's the top securities regulator in the state of Maine tells an amazing story of her elderly mother up at a village in Maine up near the Canadian border. The credit union called the kids saying, we don't like what's going on here with your mom. So she goes up, it is a scam, they unravel it. But the credit union really felt that under bank secrecy rules it was taking a risk. It was just like, we just feel we have to say this even if there's liability. So in Maine, they set up this really cool thing 
where they bring in banks, not just the managers, but the tellers, and they talk about the circumstances where you can report your suspicions. And federal law has changed, uh, even under the present administration. And um, there is more protections for financial services people if they've taken the training. Stockbrokers, under new rules promulgated by the uh, self-regulatory body called FINRA, when you sign up a new account, the broker has to ask for a trusted emergency contact. If they think something's weird, can they call them? They have to ask, you don't have to give it to them. P.S. Banks don't have to ask that. Banks don't. It might be nice if there was a system for that. Um, and then here in Florida, it was Shannon Miller who very patiently explained to my non-legal mind and my <laughs> listeners about the newish uh, exploitation rule. We can put like a pause in when uh, people think scams are afoot so that there can be a review and it can, be, it can happen quite quickly because typically the money is gone very quickly and when it's gone, it's usually gone, as I say. What about other advice? Well, we know that, and part of our gathering here today is about this, when you open people's eyes to the patterns of typical scams, they're kind of aware of them. So as more and more people learned about the tech support scam, the number, the, the incidence has gone down. And I think it's just because people have heard of it. Oh, that's what they do. Um, you hope that people doing online dating with people they never met will start to hear more of these stories and be more suspicious, but you know, what did Shannon call them? Twisted heart cases. You know, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, affairs of the heart. Um, one of our experts ha asked me to tell the young man whose mom was being scammed to, to draw up a spreadsheet about all the money that had gone out, to see it starkly on the page. That's kind of an objective thing. He did it, it didn't work in her case, but I bet it would work in other cases. And then, this was not my idea. I wish it was, I could patent it. But <laughs> there's another talk that loved ones, trusted loved ones need to have with people they care about. I just call it in this piece, The Talk, capital T, twice. Let me see if I can give you a little example that didn't go as well as I'd wanted. Um, but, let's see if this works. Big question, how do we protect ourselves and our loved ones? And my suggestion is, have the talk. This talk is about when and how a person would want help from people they trust managing their more day-to-day -day financial decisions. Here's some questions you might ask. As you get older, what are important things to you to spend your money on? If your family has to get directly involved with your money decisions, when do you want that to happen? And who's in that conversation? And here's one piece of the talk that I had with my own dad while he was visiting his old stomping grounds in Brooklyn. So let's talk here. The scam attempts are not going to slow down. They're coming into my phone, too. Phone rings, things come in. I mean, what are you going to do in the future to keep absolutely sure that you're protected and don't lose mine? Well, uh, two things. One is to continue to try to cut these people off before they even start. I think that's the simplest. Don't engage. Don't engage. I think it's right. not engage. Yeah. I'm very skeptical of phone calls that uh, I don't know the person or I don't know. And um, so I often will say, I do not respond to unsolicited Phone calls, yeah. You know. And you gotta watch the emails too. Oh, yeah, of course, the emails, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if I don't recognize the name and they have a button in which you can press and where it'll say, do you, is this spam? Do you want to unsubscribe? So I often do that. Bringing up money issues and scam prevention before anyone's lost money is vastly easier than later when suspicions precede judgment from contaminating the conversation. Most important thing, a person should be encouraged to draw a plan for managing finances later in life. And they should have support. So families be around, present, and available. My dad and I talk more about films and politics than we do about money. 
but it's good to know that if something ever came up, we're on the same page. I don't know if you caught that last photo of the two of us. My dad is a scholar, is a Moby Dick scholar, Melville. And he really looks like Ahab in Starbuck, <laughs> the two of us. I mean, he pointed that out. Um, so you're getting this? Uh, so it didn't go that well. I wanted to talk more deeply in this conversation. My father's like, not on camera. Um, and I considered what you saw here a piece of a longer conversation. Just so we're clear. It's not a question, it's not a discussion about the will. It's about how he wants to dispose of his assets when he's gone. That's the will discussion, inheritance. It's not the advanced directive discussion that we're nudged about whenever we go in. That's another thing, and people know that's a thing. The talk is, an, is something that we isn't a thing yet, which is, could be a time when you need help making money decisions. Think that through a little bit. Who's the one? Is, is it all three? He has three kids, my siblings and I, uh, or is it his younger spouse? What, like, what's the story? That's the conversation I'll, uh, I'm working toward in private with him. Um, and I think that will be helpful um, because you don't want to be coming back from the doctor's office with them when there's been a diagnosis of a cognitive impairment having that discussion. That's going to be a harder discussion still. We also had in the piece Art Schreiber's story. Art moved in with his son and daughter-in-law after his wife passed away. He was in his early 80s, outside St. Louis. Art was probably shrewd about money. He became the top insurance regulator in the state of Missouri at one point, earlier in his career. So dad is suddenly living with the adult kids, sharing a home office, and the son, who's an IT guy for a bank, notices dad is getting bombarded many times a day with people trying to pick his pocket. At one point, the son, Chad, is sitting there doing some work and he sees his dad on the cell phone walking toward the car. He's like, dad's gonna be driving, who's he on the phone with? So he runs in there. It's one of these, you've gotten a government grant schemes. We just need some fees if you go to, um, if you go to Western Union and wire it. So Chad jumps in the car and they're going to Western Union, but in fact, Chad drives them over to the father's bank and kind of winks at the bank manager. They sit down, and it was the bank manager who was able to get through to the father that this was not legit. But it kept happening. I mean, like, Chad had to sort of leap up and pull the phone out of his dad's hand a few times. His father got into binary options as an investment, which I regard as gambling, Others regard as an investment strategy. Recently, a lot of the center of that industry used to be in Israel. The Israeli government shut down the whole industry because it was so scammy. And in fact, the CEO of the company that had taken money from uh, the guy in Missouri was arrested when she got off a plane in, uh, in the United States and I think is still awaiting trial in Maryland. Um, you know, this is overseas kind of scale, and as I say, industrial scale. Um, I talked to the dad. He had since moved out of that home and into an assisted living facility where he, you could call, but he didn't have a cell phone. So that was one extra layer of protection. He had no diagnosis of dementia. Um, I talked to him. He was like, yeah, I get that we have to be careful, he said on tape. But then he said, but you know, I, uh, you have to be open to the possibility that you can get rich quick. <laughs> oh, hey. um, all right, but I talked to the family recently and there is a formal diagnosis now of dementia. Okay, fits into that pattern. Um, who are the perps? So I just mentioned one who's, who is at last check awaiting trial from a company overseas. Um, you know that uh, law enforcement people talked about scammer schools in South Asia where people get formal training in how to rip people off? Do you, <laughs> you must have seen this. This room will be very sophisticated about this, so it won't be as a surprise. The scammer that picked the wrong victim, um, the Jamaican scammer who tried to rip off William Webster, the former head of the FBI and the former head of the CIA, the same guy. So DOJ did a press conference with, um, now William Webster didn't live alone. 
He has a younger wife. And she also was on to it and was part of this, but it escalated to death threats. We have some of the audio in our piece in which they're, I'm gonna burn your house down once they realize that these people were pushing back. It was super intense. But that was uh, people from the islands who had gotten a hold, Lord knows how, maybe the dark web with information. The scammer knucklehead had looked up the guy and saw that he was a judge, but didn't do further research like the C student he probably is. He's doing time, serious time. They thought he would get a couple years, he got like six. Um, but there are enablers for this too. There's the Montana writer who had been creating solicitations for scams. Like who wrote it? The, the, the authorities found the person. Who printed it? They found that person in Las Vegas. Uh, not in the case of William Webster, but in other cases. But I'm talking around the other crucial issue. And I'm minding my time here. Uh, it's not just strangers. Right? It's family. Um, an expert from the Pacific Northwest told me it's often the adult child who failed to launch. They had three good ones and one not so good one. Uh, living with a parent in a caregiving role, starting to feel entitled. It could be someone who's a relative or a friend who's an addict, opioid, gambling, shopaholic. So how could I illustrate this? We looked around and um, do you remember Brooke Astor, the rich socialite? Do you remember? She was, um, her son, who was very much an adult, was convicted late in his life of, uh, of working to mislead her about her money. And it was the grandson, uh, Anthony Marshall, of Brooke Astor, um, who figured it out. The father had kept him from seeing his, his grandmother unsupervised, but he snuck in, and her caregiving team, nurses and so forth, called him aside and said, there's stuff going on that's not right. And what really got him in trouble was he had worked it out so that he would get a salary for managing some of her affairs. And that's what got him in trouble. He didn't die in prison. I think they let him out uh, and he passed away. This is the son. Um, I, there's a lot of conflicting data on this, but one number that stands out for me is that 58% of perps who financially exploit elders are not just caregivers, but in fact relatives. Okay. Need to bring up another issue that we took on in this piece. I'd call it a delicate balance that my own thoughts are evolving on. Maybe you can help me with. I'll certainly be taking notes as different presentations are made. A delicate balance. Uh, Marie Therese Connolly won the MacArthur for her work in elder justice, and she's just coming out with a book she says is going to have the title Aging Dangerously. <laughs> she says, in the name of protecting people, we cannot ever treat people as second-class citizens or infantilize them. Um, her quote is, we have this balancing of autonomy and safety and privacy that we have to do if you make a lot of really bad decisions, she acknowledges. Assets that you need for housing or care can be gone in a flash and we can't just sit idly by, but can we really treat people differently? So I came back at her with, why can't credit card companies use their superpowers to watch over more carefully the transactions of older people. You could also imagine if a person of a certain age walks in to get a gift card, maybe there'd be an extra question. She says, why just do that for older people? Just do it for everybody. Why does it have to be an age? It's a very interesting discussion to have. Mark Lax, the age-associated financial vulnerability guy, wrote a book about we can never infantilize people that autonomy is the most important thing. We must allow, them, uh, allow people to have their independence and be the captain of their own financial ship. He wrote a book about this that was quite popular. He is the one who says, even though I wrote that, how is it that we let a 90-year-old enter into a complex trust arrangement without some kind of review of their cognitive state? That is controversial. Wall Street wants to help 
but how much does it really want to get involved in diagnosing people's cognitive function? I talked to one financial services professional in Charlottesville. He said, oh, no, no, we do it. If the client uh, is uh, of a certain age and they're not in the Charlottesville area, we are required to get on Skype with them once a year. And so like a broker is going to be sitting there with a, dim, with a blurry Skype going, oh, they seem fine. Um, you know, God knows who's standing right next to them making faces and, and so forth. So uh, this is what society is certainly not for some radio guy to uh, resolve this. I do have to say that my ideas on this have evolved slightly knowing Nurse Judy. She was very independent and really was running her own life in a way that she was, seemed happy with and got herself, because of these onslaughts, these powerful forces, in a terrible situation. So now she's more protected through the help of Shannon, actually. Um, the son has taken much more control of her finances. When I talked to her the other day, he pays all her bills. I don't know if this is an ideal situation, but this is the way it is. And she has one debit card that she can make smaller transactions. And she says, I feel like an elf and he's Santa Claus. Okay, so she doesn't have the independence, but on the other hand, she super doesn't have independence because she lost all the money. I don't even want to actually phrase it that way. She didn't lose all the money. The money was taken from her. She didn't lose the money. So this is the thing for, uh, for society to, um, to wrestle with. And a professor that we talked to that we feature his dad's story in the piece emailed me the other day. And a student of his, a law school student of his, turned to him for help in an elder financial exploitation case in the student's family because they had seen that the professor was in my piece. And um, the relative lost 200 grand in a flash. It just disappeared. So I have to share this last bit of tape with you from the piece. Typically, I'm one of those hit-and-run journalists that you, everyone hates. You know, I have a short uh, relationship uh, journalistically with someone. We do a big interview. We put it on the air, do what we say we're going to do with it, and then we move on. Because I have to cover everything from, you know, we were covering Hong Kong this week with the unrest there. We cover all these different things competing for our attention. Um, but in the case of the people that were featured in the documentary, it was more of a sustained relationship. So I had done an interview in September of last year where she told the stories that you heard. I went back precisely a year ago, I think it might have been a year ago today, to follow up. She didn't have her documents first time I saw her. She had sent the documents to the son. The son didn't want to talk to me. I had to get some corroboration for this story. Otherwise, it's just a yarn, a little outlandish yarn. So she'd gotten the documents and took some forensic work, that's not something I'm expert at, going through it, and there it was. And then she, in that pile of stuff were the gift cards that you saw. She'd kept the receipts. So I was able to link, because the gift card just looks like a used gift card. You don't know how much. Was it $10? Well, there it was, $1,000, $1,000, $2,000. Um, so I go back the second time. I eventually saw her a couple more times and talked to her many times. A year ago, I think today, the big question, how do we protect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this happens. She told me she wised up after the massive loss, and it sure appeared that she had. She seemed self-aware about her age and vulnerability when I put it to her this way. Do you think if this guy had called when you were in your 30s, you would have acted exactly the same way? No. How come? Because I would have been more suspicious. Yet, the scam attempts kept rolling in. A year to the week after the first scam, I was doing a follow-up in her living room. Her answering machine had 15 fresh calls from this odd-sounding, maybe filtered voice pestering her about some big prize she won, supposedly $2 million to be delivered that afternoon to her house if she paid an upfront fee. Then, as I was sitting there recording the interview, the phone rang again, and she put it on the speakerphone live. Say it again. Two, one, two, 
million dollars. That's very nice. Where did I get the other point two from? Because your money was sitting at the Federal Reserve Bank. So during the process of you claiming your price, you automatically gained interest on your money of two hundred thousand dollars. At the Fed, yeah, yeah, right. On that day, Judy wasn't buying the briefcase boy on the phone to sell it. She called in the cops, who showed up while I was there, told her to be careful, and agreed to watch the street for a bit. Judy seemed to have her guard up, or so I thought. That was last fall. But when I phoned Judy back at the end of March, sweepstakes scammers were at her yet again. But this time, she told me she had given them money and thought maybe a prize would actually get delivered. I was able to alert a sister who lives two states away. After days of back and forth, Betsy Goff got her sister Judy, reluctantly, to sign a power of attorney. So that we could sort of help her avoid whatever corrupt liars create this kind of behavior. But the phone is still ringing. Hello? Judy? Well, I know you're coming in to hear me. Hello? They're calling her all hours. They're waking her up so she wasn't getting sleep. Um, it was really crazy stuff. You know when she called the cops? I left something out, which was that um, just before I went for the second, that second interview where that happened, she sent me an email saying, oh, yeah, and I got really worried about her as a source. She said, the cops were here in the middle of the night checking on my welfare, and I haven't gotten much sleep. That was the night before I showed up the second time. I was like, oh, what? The cops were in, they came into you? She said they came into her bedroom. I'm like, wait. You know, that's like a red flag for any reporter. And so I, I drove down there, it was hours, and I was thinking, this isn't going to work. So when she called the police, because this guy said a person with $2 million was coming to her correct home address, they came over and the Captain, first of all, I had to put down the microphone because I don't want to be like a stranger in her house holding a metal object when the cops came in. Uh, so, you know, what can they do? They said, well, watch your street for a little bit. And they, they said, there's a lot of retirees in this particular town, and this, thing, this stuff kind of happens. But then the captain says, you know, ma'am, uh, several of my officers walked right in through your front door last night, and you really need to lock your front door. She goes, I don't like locking my front door. I like the freedom. They're like, lock your door. There's no wall around this particular town. Anybody can walk in. They had walked into her bedroom because someone had called in a welfare check. She called her son. Were you calling the cops about me? No. The scammer called the cops to wake her back up. And it wasn't crazy. I had a cop saying that they had walked into her bedroom to check on her. And, you know, she's not, it's not her. It's, that's the level. And so what kind of superwoman could resist that? It, you know, super duper person, but not a regular person. That's what we're dealing with. I think it's a huge issue for the country. We're continuing to follow the story on my show in the midst of impeachment stuff and all this other stuff. We had a researcher on from Georgetown the other day who had uh, some harder numbers on when a person is scammed, it, uh, the chances that they get a later diagnosis of dementia is elevated in, a, in, in statistically significant ways. We thought that was very interesting and wanted to. Because like, all right, they're, they don't, they're not demented. I don't have to pay attention as much as I think I should, it, that you, maybe you should. So we'll continue to follow this. I'm here as a participant a little bit, but I'm really here to take notes and listen to the people who really know what they're talking about coming up next. So thank you for your amazing attention. I appreciate it.